takeaways. We're going to take a look at that West Ham game again and see what five things we can take away from the game. First up is Romero's return. Yeah, and he actually had a really good return, I felt, Romero. Obviously, he got the goal, which put us 1-0 up. But I just felt when it comes to his proactive defending and being dominant and making sure that the attackers aren't getting up, getting on the ball and the ball's played to them and making sure West Ham had a lack of focal point, I thought he was really good at that. Stats on the day, uh, two out of two ground duels, one, two out of two aerial duels, two tackles, 94% passing accuracy as well. And obviously, yeah, he scored the opening goal, which... Uh, um, put Spurs 1-0 up. Um, obviously, we did end up losing the game and I don't know what Romero could have done uh, for those two goals. Not much anyway. I don't think he was at fault for either. But um, in terms of his individual display back in the team, I thought he had a pretty good uh, comeback. Yeah, um, I do agree with that. To be honest, I felt like, especially in the first half, he was just so high up on the pitch and winning the ball back time and time again and helping us uh, control that game uh, in the first half. And it's just a shame uh, the way things turned out because it's just another series of unfortunate events that does occur. You know, the ball just cannons off Romero, cannons off Davis, who finds Jaron Bowen in behind. Second one... Um, him and Davis are caught ball watching, to be honest. But even if Romero does react, it's still very unlikely that he keeps that ball out of the net. So um, it's hard to put anything down to Romero. But if I am being really harsh, I would say you've got to react quicker for that second goal, uh, just on the off chance that you can kind of um, steer the ball away from going in. But it doesn't take away from a great return for Kuti Romero, that's for sure. But let's move on to number two. And Ange alluded to it and he said, no conviction. Yeah, and I think the stats bear it out when it comes to the lack of conviction we did have in front of goal. We, you know, I think this term all bark and no bite probably comes to uh, mind when you talk about Spurs yesterday in the final third. 75% possession we had, 23 shots on goal, se seven, sorry, 23 shots, seven shots on target as well. Yet yeah, West Ham with 11 shots on the day had did have a higher XG than Tottenham, which goes to show the quality of chances they had compared to Spurs, 2.23 uh, for West Ham, 1.79 for Spurs, albeit if you look at the two goals West Ham scored, uh, uh, the XG probably couldn't be much higher yeah. uh, for those two chances. And as well, um, if you look at the second goal, they probably get double XG because there was two shots and they're probably both very high XG. So yeah. are they a bit, is it a bit skewed probably? All that XG just comes from those two chances, Yeah, literally, it? literally. It's probably a bit skewed, the XG, but um, still they did not manage to get more XG against us um, in, the, in those in those moments. Yeah, but everyone's going on, like I see on social media, oh, you got out XG'd at home to, to, to uh, West Ham and stuff, but it doesn't tell the whole story. It doesn't tell the whole story, but I think it also goes to show our XG could have been a bit, I mean, 1.79, it's not terrible, but it comes from a lot of shots. And in fact, a Apart from Richarlison's header, which was 0.33 xG, no one had a higher xG than 0.1. So, it, I think that goes to show the quality of chances was a bit lacking going into the, um, in this game. And um, yeah, I think that that's evidence of it because no one apart from that Richarlison chance really had a very high xG. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on to number three, and that is Poro provides. Yeah, and a really strong performance again from Pedro Porro. He's been so consistent this season. And um, I think yesterday he had a brilliant overall game, had five shots um, in total, two out of two dribbles, completed four out of 19 crosses, uh, three out of five long passes. He had five key passes, which is more than anyone else on the pitch. One big chance created. And as well, the stat um, on the end of yesterday was that Porro has been now been involved in 10 goal contributions since making his debut in February, which is more than any other player, uh, fullback, sorry, apart from Trent Alexander-Arnold in the Premier League. So I think that goes to show the quality that Pod Porro has. And a lot of people saying, you know, um, he is one of the best defensive fullbacks when it, um, in the Premier League. And I think, you know, those stats are evident of that. Yeah, I think um, I've said it time and time again on this stream and pr before, but I'll say it again. I think he's been our best player this season or our most consistent performer. That's uh, for sure. Him and Vicario, in my opinion, are, are two that top the list, along with Hyung min Son as well. So um, I can't sing Pedro Porro's praises enough. Everything that we've said that he needs to improve on, he has improved on and is still improving on. Uh, his ta attacking output is brilliant. His defensive play is getting better and better game on game. Um, and he's just uh, an 
an assured defender now, to be honest. And um, that provides going the other way. So I think he's probably been the best uh, right back performer this season, on, if you take the whole season into account. That's a big shout. It's a big shout. But let's move on to number four, and that is unwanted records. And uh, Spurs got a few records uh, yesterday, <laughs> probably records that we don't want. Uh, first team in Premier League history to not win five consecutive games when taking the lead. Sorry, well, to take the lead in five consecutive games and not win, I should say. Uh, that's the record. Another record we got yesterday was the first team in Premier League history to lose three consecutive home games after taking the lead. And another bit as well is that it's the first time Spurs have lost three consecutive home games since 2007, which is uh, hard to imagine. Um, Who was our manager then? Uh, probably it was the later days of Martin Yol, I think. Mm. Uh, Martin Yol's uh, last few games as Spurs manager. So some unwanted records from from, uh, from Tottenham uh, yesterday completed, unfortunately. Let's hope we can end it on Sunday. <sighs> Let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> I keep saying that every week. But yeah, it's, it's frustrating uh, going through this at the moment. We always seem to get those unwanted records here at Tottenham Hotspur. Um, I've never seen a team go... Top of the league, unbeaten after 10 games, winning so many games, and then the next five games, four defeats and a, and a, and a draw. I've just I, never I seen do that wonder, before. I wonder, like, if we don't win on Sunday, that'll be six games that I'll win. I don't remember when we've last gone six games. Maybe last, potentially back end of last season, actually, might have done. I can't remember, though. I don't think we did at the back end of last Probably season. Not, didn't we didn't win one. Yeah, we won Palace here and there. Yeah. So, if anyone, anyone in the comments know, when was the last time Tottenham did went six games without a win? Uh, let us know in the comment section uh, and hopefully we don't do it on Sunday. Yeah, uh, but it's an extremely difficult game as well, especially with Newcastle on the back of that 3-0 defeat. They're going to want to right those wrongs as well. So um, it's going to be incredibly difficult, but we'll be there and we'll be backing them, the boys to win, obviously. But let's move on to the fifth and final takeaway. And that is still in it. Yeah, and it's hard to forget, hard to remember, sorry, but with all this bad form and Seemingly, you know, a lot of teams at the moment in good form, but we're still only three points off fourth. We're still in, actually in fifth position as well. And I think that's testament to the good start we had. And this is what I was actually saying. Even I said this after, I remember saying this after the Chelsea game, that yes, we've got injuries and yes, we have a bad run, but we could go on a bad run and still be, because of, because of the stop we've had to the season because of the kind of buffer we gave ourselves we could actually go on a bit of a losing run and still be in I don't think you envisaged it to be this bad I did <laughs> thought, no, no, you're right I didn't think it would be this bad to be fair I was, I was hoping there'll be at least one or two wins in these next in these games here obviously I didn't envisage four losses and a draw in the next uh, in the next five games but I did say even if we were to go on a bad run we would still be in contention for top four and we could just come in, if we could just come out come out of the or out of this run on the other end of it, still in contention within three or six points, then I still give us a good chance in the second half of the season of getting into that Champions League. So, mm. um, look, four, five wins, five games out win, and we're still in fifth place, which is a positive. So, let's hope that this winning, winning this run doesn't go on for much longer. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're looking at that top four, though, like you're looking at Arsenal, Liverpool, Villa, and Man City. Man City, in a weird way, look the weakest one out of the four at the moment. With, yeah, it's four. Uh, I, but, you know, Man City, what they do in the second half of the season, they just go win 20 games in a row and they go and win the league. Um, but the, the team that you're obviously looking to catch there is Aston Villa. And with that home form that they're showing, and if they do carry that on until the last stage of the season, it's going to be, it will be incredibly difficult to get into that top four. It's going to be, look, wherever where you slice it, whether it's, whether it's Villa, whether even teams below us in, you know, Man United, Newcastle, they're going to be difficult as well mm. to, to stop uh, overtaking us. They're, they're very close to us. Only Newcastle will go above us if they win. So it's going to be a dogfight. I, th I think Villa will drop, uh, to be honest. I think I did think it's going to be City, Liverpool and Arsenal in that top three. Um, I do think Villa are a good team, but I, I look at their away form and for me, that that I, I think it still lacks consistency. So, uh, and also, it's not just consistency, performance level away from home. It just doesn't look the same as it is at home. But at home, they're astounding. So They're man Villa, they're, both of them. They're, they're incredible. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a massive, massive dogfight. It's, but it's going to be for that fourth and fifth for sure. I think mm. there are two spots there. Yeah, I mean, let's hope fifth does end up being Champions League. To be honest, I think at the moment it is. There's no guarantees, but at the moment I believe England are top of the coefficient. Mm. So if it ended today, it would be England, but there's no guarantee that how it ends. 
All right. Well, those are our five takeaways from the game against West Ham. Let me know in the comment section your thoughts on the takeaways.